We are starting a new series this week onwards, and the series is titled, Christ is Dash. And I've intentionally left this blank so that we can fill that with something new, something awesome that God is going to show us about Christ every week. And so I wanted to start today as an introduction to this whole series. Why do we want to do this? You know, over the weekend, I found out something new about my kids, Brian and Sophia. They have a new superhero now. You know who that is? Iron Man. I just um, had them watch this two-minute clip from Iron Man Part 2, you know, where there is this Formula One racing that's happening in Monaco, and there's this bad guy who comes, and he rips these race cars into two, and, and then out of that, Iron Man emerges, and then he gets his suit, and as he gets into it, and he beats up the bad guy, I could see the excitement growing in Brian and Sophia, and they were like, wow, he's so awesome. And it just got so locked into his head that Jamie Moore was telling me when she was putting him to bed, he was describing scene by scene by scene to her. He said, you know what Iron Man did? You know how he went? You know how these race cars? And she was like, why did you show these kids? <laughs> and since then, he's been like, Iron Man is awesome. I want, I want to dress up like him. I want to... I want to um, watch more. I want to uh, be like Iron Man. You know, for a child, that is that childlike captivation when they see there is an awesome hero and how he is rescuing people. But Bible has several heroes too. You know, think of some of the greatest biblical figures who lived, who you are fascinated about. There's Abraham, there is Joseph, there's Moses, there's Joshua, there is Ruth, there is King David, there is Elijah, there's Elisha, there is Jonah, there is Daniel, there's Mary, there's John the Baptist, there is Peter, there is Paul. I'm sure we all have people that we admire in the Bible. Or we can look at the history of the church and there have been these amazing heroes God used to do extraordinary things, starting with Augustine in the early centuries to Calvin who triggered this reformation, and, and, and Jonathan Edwards and, and, and Charles Spurgeon, or even in political and military history, you know, from Alexander the Great or Constantine or Napoleon or Winston Churchill or Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., are heroes who captivate us by, by things that they do. Yet all of these superheroes fade away when compared to the one who stands tall above them all, Jesus Christ. You know, the theologian Mark Jones, he captures this beautifully. I was just fascinated reading this. He said, what is Samson's strength when compared to that of Jesus who was raised in power? What is Solomon's wisdom when compared with that of the one whom all the treasures of wisdom are contained? What is Methuselah's age when compared with the age of the one who lives forever in eternity? What are Paul's visions of heaven when compared with the sight of Christ of heaven? What are Elisha's miracles when compared with the incarnation and the resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ? If a worldly superhero like Iron Man can excite a child, do we get excited about this awesome Jesus Once we see Jesus in this exciting way, he will begin to captivate our minds and set our hearts on fire and, 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 and kindle and, and a desire in us that supersedes every other desire we have. And so Jesus realizes he spent time on earth with his disciples. I mean, they've lived with him 24-7, so he takes them with him to this mountain, near this mountain top. You know, Israel is kind of like 
California in its topography. And Jesus moves from like the Bay Area to the plains of Lake Tahoe and mostly people are not Jews there and, and he goes around and then he calls his disciples and he asks them a question. And that's the first thing we're going to look at. The biggest question of our life. The biggest question of our life. And he asks them, who do people say that the Son of Man is? You know, we normally live life, we don't ask too many questions. We just go through the routine. But there comes something where someone comes and they ask you a question and you think about it. And the answer to that question radically changes your life. Have you had that experience? It could have happened when you were in school, when you were choosing which course to take, or it could have happened in your jobs or in your careers. You know, there's a, st a true story of a person, Dr. T.E. Koshi. You know, he um, was dreaming to become a high-powered lawyer, and he wanted to reach the educated elite in India for Jesus. And he wanted to become a foreign correspondent. And he wanted to travel the world. And he was also mentored by uh, Brother Bhak Singh, who was the pioneering pastoral missionary India has ever produced. They, I think there are some 10,000 churches that are still going all around the world. It's one of my heroes. And, and, and when when his mentor, when he met his mentor and he shared this vision for his life, you know, Bhak Singh asked him this question because he was thinking, I don't want to spend my time in these dirty, poverty-stricken streets of India. I want to walk the halls of power in the world's important capitals. I want to, you know, my, and so he received like five degrees and, and he wanted to travel to Washington, D.C. as a journalist. But then Bhak Singh challenged him, he said, you know the only thing God is building in the world? Do you know what is the only thing God is building in the world? He's building his church. Why do you want to write about history when you can make it? Why spend your life reporting about the rich and famous when you can invest your life helping the humble and needy meet the God who loves them and gave himself for them? If you have no successor, are you truly a success? These questions messed him up. And the man made some radical decisions. I'm going to share about what happens later on that changed the trajectory of his life. So here is Jesus talking to his disciples. All right, guys, you, you've been with me. You've seen these people. What are these people saying? You know, I've done these miracles. I've done these great teachings. Who do they think I am? There is this awesome quote by A.W. Tozer in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. And listen to this carefully. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Can we repeat that together? What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Who is Jesus? When you think about the word Jesus Christ, what comes into your mind? What are you thinking about him? What are you thinking about who he is? What are you thinking about the things he has done? That's going to tell you who you are. Your job is not going to tell you who you are. Your title is not going to tell you who you are. The money you have is not going to tell you who you are. Who you think Jesus is tells you who you are. And guess what? Jesus himself is interested in knowing the answer to this question. And what do people respond? You know, the first response by people who are not very religious people, ordinary people, they, they think he is John the Baptist. And there is a historical reason behind that. You know, the city he is going, it's called Caesarea Philippi. It was named after Herod's brother Philip. And, and if you go a couple of chapters earlier, you can read that Herod actually took the wife 
of his brother Philip and was having an affair and living with her. And John the Baptist, you know, he's pretty nasty. He called him out and said, what you're doing is wrong. And Philip's wife did not like it, and she wanted John's head on a platter. And that's what happened. We know the story. So when Jesus came up, Herod thought, oh, this is John the Baptist who was resurrected and he's come again. And you know, when you're living in a town and you know that this is what happened to the wife of the most important person in town, everybody knows that. So when they saw Jesus, they thought, oh, yeah, he must be this John the Baptist guy. You know, most people today don't know about Jesus. They get half-truths and their perceptions about Jesus are colored by the people they have interacted with or the news that they hear. And our views of Jesus are significantly impacted by things that need not be necessarily true. You know, right now, especially in this politically charged climate in this nation, you know, a nation that strives to keep church and politics separate, Christianity and politics are so much mingled. You know, there's a group of people who are belonging to one political party, and there's a group of people who belong to another political party. And there are Christians on both sides. And if you disclose which political party you subscribe to, the others think you're not even a saved person. <laughs> and it happens on both sides. And, and if people who claim to be Christians and are ref claiming to represent one political party do or say things that actually offend the other person, they end up thinking, oh, this Jesus must not be cool. Look at these guys. So that's what's happening here. They, they don't know who Jesus is. But knowing the real Jesus is going to be the most awesome experience of your life. If you are here and if you have never had an encounter with the real Jesus, I want to encourage you to be open today. Drop down your pre presuppositions, what you have had about Jesus. You know, maybe your friends could have disappointed you in the past, but I want you to see who Jesus is for yourself. When you do, you're going to see how awesome he is. What a glorious person like we sang he is. He never lets us down. It'll, it'll be an amazing, joyful experience in your life. And then it says, others say Elijah. And some others say Jeremiah. You know, these were some of the religious people. Because in, in the Old Testament, the Bible which the Jews read, in one of the last books, in, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a degree of utter destruction. So they were anticipating someone like Elijah to come. So they saw Jesus and they thought, this is Elijah or Jeremiah. These were people who knew their Bibles. These were people who read the prophets. These were people who knew the redemptive history of Christ. And yet when Jesus Christ is right there, right before him, they couldn't recognize him. You know, we could be Christians for a long time. We could have grown up in the church and heard all the stories of these great heroes from the Bible, from the church. We could have engaged in understanding God intellectually, theologically, and all of that. And still you cannot know Jesus. It is possible. It's like, you know, couples who are married for a long time. And you would think, hey, they must really know each other a lot and find out that they actually don't. You know, there's this funny story. A woman once said, my husband and I have a very happy marriage. We've been married for nearly 45 years. There's nothing I wouldn't do for him. And there's nothing he wouldn't do for me. So we've gone through life doing nothing for each other. It's so funny, right? It's true. Same thing. I can say, I've been a Christian for 40 years. Oh, yeah? 
I love Jesus. Oh, really? What has Jesus done for you? Nothing. What have you done for Jesus? Nothing. And that's not funny. And therefore, Jesus asks this big, important question. Who do they say I am? If you say, oh, I believe he is God. I know he died for my sins and I have this ticket, you know. I got a great deal, like Costco. If I die, I'll go to heaven. I got it. It's, it's there. And he's cool. Christmas, I, I, I love Christmas. You know, the carols and, and the cakes. and you know, Easter is even more fun. I mean, resurrection, this is all cool. But there's nothing personally awesome I have seen or known in Jesus. And if you're not excited like this childlike excitement that Brian has when he just sees Iron Man, if you don't have that excitement when we think about Jesus, when we, when we see Jesus in the pages of Scripture, it's a problem. And that explains why for most of us, prayer is hard. Why for most of us, reading the Bible is a chore. You know, we have called this year as the year of the Bible. Where we want to dig deep and get into God's word and have a very deep relationship with God. And if you are saying, I'm struggling, I'm not able to do that. Of course it will if you're not excited about Jesus. If you're not excited, I want to go there and I'm going to, I'm going to have an encounter with Jesus today. I'm going to see Jesus and that's going to be very exciting. And this Jesus, if he is not relevant to my daily life, I'm not going to go there. That explains that. And that's partially the reason we're doing this series, because it is my desire that we will restart this love for Jesus. We will, we will start seeing amazing things about Jesus from Genesis to Revelation that will get us excited, that it no longer becomes a chore. We, we, we love to spend time in his presence. We love to spend time in his word. And then... Secondly, we move on to the biggest revelation of our life. He turns to disciples. He says, all right, let's leave these religious people and these non-religious people. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter, who's like the spokesman for them, says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The grand response and before he could think he's just too smart, Jesus corrects him and says, and he says, and Jesus answered him. You know, the Greek word for answered is not the word that's used always. The word that always is used is lego, which means speak. The Greek word here is um, apokrino, which means from judgment, where Jesus knows the heart of the person to whom he is going to respond. He sees through the heart. You know, he sees through our heart when we say, a response, and he says, blessed are you. He pronounces a beatitude upon him. Simon, bar Jonah, means son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Wow. For Jesus, this is a personal question. It's not just enough if you guys hang out with me as my disciples, Peter. I want you to know the real me. I want you to know who I really am. And trust me, you can't figure it out by your smartness. You can't figure it out by doing things. My father has to reveal this to you. Unless God reveals, Christ cannot be known. You know this book, uh, my all-time favorite book, and I'm sure if you have been my friend, you, I would have forced you to read this at least once. It's called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Read this two, three times, and, and one of the awesome quotes that Packer says is, knowing God is different from knowing about God. You can know all about God and still not know God. And I feel that many of us lie in that predicament for a long time. Do we know Jesus in, in more than an intellectual sort of a way that he actually makes a difference in our lives? 
If we know this Jesus, how we see Jesus will impact how we deal with crisis. How we see Jesus will impact how we deal with our marriage, our relationship with our spouse. How we see and know Jesus will impact how we fix the priorities for our lives. How we see Jesus will impact how we deal with our failure and brokenness. If Jesus is asking every one of us today the question he asked Peter, who do you say I am? What would you say? You know, the right answer to this question is simple enough to save a child. And at the same time, it's complex enough to keep theologians busy for all eternity. And so Jesus prays in John chapter 17, verse 3, he gives a radical definition of what is eternal life. He says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We think eternal life is this happily living after, walking on streets of gold and singing songs. But Jesus redefines. You know what eternal life is? It's about knowing who Jesus is. This is what heaven is like. And if eternity means knowing Jesus Christ, we cannot afford to be ignorant about him now on this short life on earth. What this means is that it's going to be so much in Jesus to keep knowing about him that will give us joy and enable us to praise him and worship him for eternity. It's not just a two-minute clip of Iron Man doing a heroics on a racetrack, because after that he ends up in trouble. This is Jesus for eternity. What you're going to discover in him is just going to keep the, draw the deepest sense of joy and praise and adoration towards him. I, I really enjoy, in one of, one of the things about my job, is doing premarital counseling. Not much postmarital counseling, which is when people come after volcanoes have erupted and they give you a fire hose and say, fix it. Premarital counseling is really cool. I'm doing one right now. You guys know who that is for. Because what I see is when people first come, they know a little bit about each other. There's a little bit of excitement. Yeah, this is a new thing, a new relationship we are getting into. And then we start talking, and I give people a lot of homework, by the way, if you know me. And as they do their homework, and they, they begin to discover more about each other, I can see the, the, their eyes starting to grow in a love for one another. There is more excitement. And, the, and, and, and as they are spending time preparing and all of that, their love is just getting, they, they just can't wait to get married, to just know this person even more intimately. Isn't that how it should be for us? Because we are called the bride of Christ. And now, as we wait till we see him, as we are slowly getting to know him, Every day should be more exciting than the previous day. And it was the case for most of the saints that we read about in the Bible. Again, Mark captures it beautifully. If you ask some of the greatest saints in the Bible, who was Jesus? They had a very uniquely distinct connection and understanding of Jesus. For example, for Peter, we just saw he was the son of the living God. For John, he was word became flesh. For Paul, Jesus was not only the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, but he was also the man, Christ Jesus. For the author of Hebrews, he was both the radiance of the glory of God and the one who partook in flesh and blood. For doubting Thomas, after literally touching Jesus, he memorably claimed Jesus to be his Lord and God. In the Old Testament, Isaiah has this vision about Jesus Christ, and he calls him my king, the Lord of hosts. And later on, he calls Jesus as the king, the servant of the Lord, who had no beauty that we should desire him. 
Everyone. So many different ways they're looking at Jesus. And they're excited. Who is Jesus to you? If someone asks you today, can you just give me one phrase that captivates about Jesus? In fact, Jesus himself answers the question for us. In John's gospel, we have the famous seven I am statements of Jesus. Where Jesus refers to himself, he says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true wine. In fact, the very word he uses, I am, ego eimi in Greek, is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is the self-disclosing name of God that comes to Moses in the burning bush. And the Bible gives so many different names for Jesus. He's called the teacher, the prophet, the son of David, servant, son of man, Lord, lamb of God, holy one of God, the beginning, the high priest, the living one, the deliverer, the bright and morning star. And in Revelations chapter 19, verse 12, John tells us that Jesus Christ has a name written that no one knows but himself, which means there is so much more to know about Jesus than we will know in the future. Have you experienced Christ in any of these myriad ways than a cookie-cut, stereotyped understanding that becomes dull and dull and dull day by day, becomes familiar and familiar, that you literally end up doing nothing? But here's the encouraging note. Even the best of us with the best of our efforts cannot know this Jesus unless he is revealed to us. And Jesus knows this. And so he prays for you and for me as our high priest. He prays that we may know him. Wow, that's encouraging to me. Because to know him is to love him. And aren't we called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul and all our strength? We can't know this Jesus without studying his word. You can't love God with all your mind unless you invest in, in, in understanding him. That you're meditating the truth, that it melts our hearts. You know, I keep joking around with my kids. I, I, tell, I used to tell Sophia, oh, Sophia, you, I was, we were going in the car and I was telling her, you just melt my heart. And then Brian was like, what about me? I was like, okay, you, you steal my heart. And then he says, okay, I stole your heart and I gave it to Sophia and she melted it. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. I, I can take that. Does Jesus steal our hearts? When we think about him, does he melt our hearts? Does his love just do that to us? Is he the biggest love of our lives? As he prays for us, maybe we can pray too. And ask God to reveal this to us, just like he did to Peter. Because we know what happened to Peter. Peter is the super impulsive guy. Always thinks he's there when he is so not there. He wants to be the first one to jump out of the boat and walk on water. He likes these cool experiences and thinks that's what Christianity is all about. And then he's sitting before the slave girl denying Jesus before rooster crows, despite Jesus telling him you're going to do. That's what flesh and blood can do. If you try to seek to know this Jesus in that way. And then comes Pentecost and the Holy Spirit experience. And there is this Peter standing before thousands of Jews who just a few weeks ago had crucified Jesus. He looks them in the eye and says, this Jesus whom you crucified, God made Christ and Lord. Therefore repent. That is what God can do. There's no fear anymore. Do you want that experience? I want that for my life. And guess what? Right now, Jesus is praying for that for you and me. This very moment. And that should encourage us and, and, and enable us to pray that we can have more of that. It doesn't stop there. It gets more fascinating. We come to the third and the final point, which is the biggest response or reward of our life. What happens when we see Jesus like this? 
And he says in verse 18, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is one of the most poorly exegeted passages in all of Bible. From prosperity preachers to religious leaders, they use and abuse this passage. Have you heard these prosperity preachers going and saying, I'm going to bind this in the name of Jesus, and it's going to be bound in heaven. You don't even know what this is talking about. And then people think, oh, Peter is, he's actually a Saint Peter because Jesus says he's special. No, we're going to see what he's talking about. He says, when you know Jesus like this, two amazing things happen. In fact, there's two extravagant things that happen. First, he says, he looks at Peter and he says, you, Peter, individually and collectively to all the disciples, he says, to you has this truth been revealed that I am the Christ. And it's through you guys that I'm going to build my church. And the disciples were the foundations upon whom the church was built. You know, the church, the Greek word is called out, ecclesia, people who respond to love of Christ and step forward. The church is built by people. People who know Jesus. Church is not built on programs, not on flashlights and smoke screens, but people passionately loving him and knowing him. And he says, when a church is built like that, when there are people in the church who love Jesus like that, he says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against that church. Because there is Christ in them, in every single one of them, who is going to make the church prevail. Why is the church weak? Why am I weak? If I am not even able to spend time with God's word, it doesn't matter how many years I've called myself a Christian. It doesn't matter how much theology I know. It doesn't matter how gifted I am. You're not going to prevail because there's something missing there in your life. In fact, when a church is filled with people who do not know Jesus and love Jesus, it is good if that church fails. It will fail because it cannot prevail against the gates of hell. Because this is war, as I spoke about a couple of weeks ago. This is a battlefield, and the Bible says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities of the heavenly realms. And so Jesus says, when you recognize this truth about me, you're going to be a blessing. And the second is the mind-boggling consequence where he says, whatever you bind on earth is bound on heaven. Whatever you lose on earth, you lose in heaven. What is he talking about? Jesus is saying, He's talking about kingdom building. He's going to use people who know Jesus to break, help break people from bondage to sin and self and the world and unleash them into God's kingdom. You know, Peter, when he goes and preaches, there are thousands of people who come to follow Christ. When this Paul, who is the guy who is persecuting Christian, has this encounter and sees Jesus, in such a radical way, he goes and he literally changes the world upside down. And throughout the ages, this Jesus has used very ordinary people, insignificant people, broken people. First Corinthians, it says, not many of you were wise, not many of you were noble, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. That's the power. It says... We are given when we know Jesus because then our life is different. Then you go and you, you, you talk about this Jesus, amazing things happen. You know, I spoke about Dr. T.E. Koshi at the start. 
know, someone who was mentored by boxing and he started working in rural India and then he got called to Oxford University. So he arrived at Oxford University to speak to a bunch of students and he was preparing this great speech. He went through all the philosophers starting from Aristotle and Plato and he thought, oh, these are some of the brilliant minds in the world. I need to give them this amazing talk and as he praised the night before the speech, God convicts him and messes him up and says, I don't want you to talk this. I just want you to tell them about what you know about Jesus, what do you know about me. So with shivering, he goes the next day to the organizer and says, I'm sorry, I can't speak on this topic, but I just want to speak on something else that God put in my heart. I want to talk about Jesus and what he's done for me. And reluctantly, they let him do it. And he goes through the motion, he shares to people his life story and what God has done and, and who Jesus is for him. And he's just looking to head straight at the door once he's done talking because he thinks that everyone's going to hate. And to his surprise, there's a huge line standing right after he finishes his speech. And people want to come and students are coming and I'm thanking him and then they're saying, I've never, I, I want this Jesus, I've never, I, I, you were so authentic in how you shared about this. And, and he saw there was an Indian guy who was standing at the very end. And in his heart, he wanted to talk to this guy. Not so many Indians can end up in Oxford, right? So he was like, this must be a really smart person. I want to know what this person has to say. And, and somehow he ends up going and meeting this person. And he asks him, what's your name? And he responds saying, my name is Ramachandra. And he asks him, what's your last name? And he says, please don't ask me that. He replied, when people hear my last name, they behave as if I have no first name. I'm sick and tired of that. So please don't ask me. You know, this just kindles the curiosity even more for him. And so he doesn't leave him there. So he keeps pressing on and asking him, it's okay, tell me what's your last name? And he says his last name is Gandhi. He was a great, he was a grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. And as soon as he heard his face change and he said, see, I told you, that's why I didn't want to tell you my last name. And he said, no, I'm going to still respect you and love you and care about you. And let's talk and tell me more about who you are and what's going on and all of that. And he says, well, I've been reading about Jesus and I heard what you said today and it's just fascinating and I want to know him more and understand him more. And they have a conversation and he leaves and, and after 13 years he gets to go back and he just pings this guy to see if he's there and he'd want to meet him and he does. And he has become a Christian, worshiping in a church and, and serving the Lord. This was the son of one of the greatest heroes of a nation and God used a man who was obedient to him, who just shared about the Jesus he knew. It was just so simple. He didn't need Aristotle and Plato and all those guys to convince someone. And that was, at that moment, someone's life was freed to love Jesus. And that's what he promises for you and me that he will do. That's what he says can happen when we discover this Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? What is your answer? Christ is. Whatever you feel there, does it excite you? Does it, does it give a sense of joy? So here are a few applications I have for us this evening. If you have never heard about Jesus, if you, your, your experience of who Jesus was was not that great because of some bad friendships or people that let you down, I want to encourage you to read firsthand, starting with the Gospel of John that talks about who Jesus is. I want to encourage you to try reading that whole book. Even if you've been a Christian for a long time, never read the Bible in your life from cover to cover or seriously a full book, I want to challenge you as this is the year of the Bible for us. Start with the Gospel of John, chapter a day, 
Even if you just read five days a week, you should be done in almost a month. And I'll challenge you, your life will not be the same again. And for those of us who, who know the Bible so much because we've read it so many times and it's just now not exciting and you're not even reading and it now doesn't even bother that you're not reading and it's actually annoying that when someone tells you read the Bible, why don't you maybe pray? Say, God, can you just do something to my heart? Like whatever you did to Peter, you know, can you... Can you just help me to love you more? Let me just read the Bible. Help me to get a new, something new, a new understanding, a new personal understanding and experience of you, Jesus. And if you are already doing this, may I encourage you every time you read God's word to ask him, to reveal something new about Jesus from that passage that touches you personally, that you have not experienced, and share it with your own family. When you have your family prayer, you don't have to go through a routine of reading some book that somebody else wrote or just randomly reading a Bible passage. Just tell them, hey, this is what I read about, read in my Bible, and this God showed me this, and it's just exciting about Jesus. And maybe you can hold each other accountable in your homes. As a husband and a wife, I know we ask each other, have you done this, have you done that, have you done this? How about asking, have you read your Bible today? Don't be like a spiritual cop again, okay? And then don't get me in trouble. Oh, pastor, you just made my already miserable life more miserable. You gave my husband or wife one more thing to fight with me about. (laughs) Don't do that. It's just to have a healthy experience and made, and that's my prayer and, and we are going to journey through the Bible and it's the same thing for me too I want, to, I want to present Christ this glorious Christ before us in a way that we will fall all in love over him all over again so our life can be different so as we pray I want you to think about sure you have your bulletins Write down right now, what is that one thought God is putting in your mind that he has impressed upon you today? And one thing you want to pray for as I pray for us. Let's pray. 